So this is a, uh, a project that actually started uh, probably about a year and a half ago when we first, uh, first came up with the idea. Um, you know, like a lot of great projects, this uh, actually started at the Harmon. Um, at a conversation uh, uh, between uh, me and, and my collaborator here, Mercy Stein, from the School of Education. And it was timely because uh, I, as, uh, I had just gotten done with uh, parent-teacher conferences in the fall uh, for uh, both of my kids. Uh, at the time, they were, uh, let's see, I think in third grade and seventh grade. And uh, I'd gotten some feedback from the teachers, and I thought, what are they doing? I don't understand what they're doing. And so I should probably talk to somebody you know, in education who understands you know, sort of elementary education and, and give me some insight because I don't want to quarterback this, this whole thing, right? Um, that's not what my wife said, but, 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 uh, so, so I, I had a conversation with her and I said, you know, I told her about what the kind of the feedback I'd gotten and, uh, particularly around reading, the kinds of exercises they were doing. And I said, you know, is this reasonable? And she said, it doesn't matter, Matt. It doesn't matter. She said, do your, do your kids read? And I said, they sure do. Um, too much. Uh, my wife has to go to, uh, or I, or, or I have to go to the library about twice a week, right? To keep them, keep them going. And she said, you don't have a problem. I said, I don't understand what you're talking about. And so, uh, um, you know, please, please, give me, give me some more information. And she said, you know, if kids read and understand what they're reading, they're going to be fine. And she said, more importantly, you're faculty, right? So uh, I said, well, I've only been faculty for a couple of years. She said, no, 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 you're faculty. And she said, you, you, your, your family has advanced education. Um, so, you know, they're already learning more from you than just what they're reading in the books. I said, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. And that spawned a whole conversation about how we could potentially bring additional knowledge during book reading for lots of different uh, um, uh, classrooms as well as, as households, right, across different uh, income segments. Okay, so this project is, is what we're calling it is a smart bookmark. Um, if, uh, uh, if you've seen some of the stuff I've done before, I tend to work with hardware devices and some software. I'm from the Institute of Technology, collaboration with Marcy Stein of the School of Education. Um, so what Marcy later described to me was what, what she called the achievement gap. So I said, what's the achievement gap? And she, she immediately sent me some, some email um, with, some, with some data from, from the uh, National Assessment of Education Progress. And, and it looked something like this. And she said, you know, we, we tend to divide students into those that uh, are poor or, or income challenged, or you know, their families are income challenged, um, uh, and, and those that aren't, right? And they usually separate that by whether or not um, children are eligible for free lunch. And so uh, um, she said, look at this data. And, and, and she said, you know, for those that, that are, are eligible for um, the National School Lunch Program, you know, a lot of them aren't meeting the basic requirements for um, their grade levels. She said, now compare that against the ones that don't qualify for the, the free, free lunch program, right, the school lunch program. She said, it's significantly different. I said, okay, okay, that's kind of interesting. Um, why is that? And, and, and what kind of impact can that have? And so um, she said, you know, it's a huge impact. She said, you know, the early education, you know, the, the amount of, of reading that the kids do in the early education um, has, a, has a, an impact that carries through for the rest of their lives. So, so if you have, have children who, um, who don't have the right background knowledge, don't have the reading experience, um, they're, they're almost permanently behind other students, right? And so what this graph tries to show is, is over a four-year period from fourth grade to eighth grade, what the changes are in the mean test scores Right, to understand what, what kind of achievement um, children are able to achieve or, or realize um, uh, for those two different uh, income brackets, right? And so uh, the interesting thing here is that while they both go up over time, right, the mean test scores go up over time, they don't go up the same way, right? So, so in essence, that green line and red line, you know, are, um, show how the, um, the red line shows how, what the mean test scores, test scores are for higher income, um, and how they're just barely below um, the, the mean test scores for um, uh, higher income children four years before, right? So, so this, is a, this is a big issue, right? And, and, and not having that ability or having that background knowledge is critical to it. So there's a simple view of reading, right? Where, where it's really just a matter of, of linguistic decomposition and decoding, right? But there's much more to it. Right? Reading, or, or what they call skilled reading, actually takes a lot. There's a lot involved in it, right? So it's not just, you know, decoding. Um, it's not just the decomposition. 
it's it's being able to reason, being able to have that background knowledge to, to put in context what you're reading and relate it to what you already know. Basically, it's it's background knowledge, right? Is you need you need in order to be able to do skilled reading. Otherwise, you wind up with a situation where you may be reading something, but you don't you can't relate to it, or you don't have the right knowledge to be able to uh, understand it well. Okay, so so what you need for a bunch of factors you need for comprehension, you need language skills, right? We have to be able to, to understand language. We need to be able to recognize a, a large vocabulary, word recognition. We need fluency with whatever the, the to be able to connect with the text. But most importantly, we need knowledge of those word meanings. We need to understand. We need to have the background knowledge to understand um, what those words mean. As an example, um, in another email, um, you know, she sent me this link to, to uh, um, some, some work by, um, I can't even pronounce his name, I'm going to call him Robert. And uh, it was about uh, a statement about, about President Obama's speech. And there were a lot of different references that were important to understand, to understand what, his, what his, some of his real messages were. And if you don't, didn't know what those references were, in other words, you didn't have that background knowledge, those, those, those references were completely lost on you. Right? So for those kids that don't have that fundamental background knowledge that is provided to them, often cases during reading sessions, particularly those where, where a parent or teacher is reading aloud to them, that information is lost. Okay? There's been a bunch of work done on this um, over, over, over quite a few decades. Uh, notably, there was a, a study done by uh, Hart and Risley um, back in, in the 90s that did this extensive study of, of the impact of um, you know, both income as well as, as uh, the background knowledge for students between these two different income, income brackets. Uh, it was encapsulated in this, in this book called Meaning, Meaningful Differences, um, and it led to what, what was called, or what's called the 30 million word gap. And what that shows, is that, what this graph shows, is that <clears throat> is that children who are, if you look on the far right, the uh, x-axis in this case is age of child and months, y-axis is the uh, cumulative word, words uh, addressed to the child um, you know, by the time they reach that given age. If you look at the green line for the lower income children, you know, you're talking about maybe 11 million words. Right? If you look at the, the children of, of those families from higher income brackets, or from, often from uh, professional brackets, you know, they're somewhere close to 50 million. So there's a 30 million word gap um, that children know by the age of four, right? This is, this is pre-elementary pre school um, that, that, they, that, that is a, a direct result of them not having this right, the, the right background knowledge. Okay, and what that leads to then is uh, over time, there's a um, significant reading, uh, difference in the reading age level of children, right? It doesn't just go away. It doesn't uh, uh, magically disappear um, just because they advance in, in education. Um, there's still that difference, and it persists for the rest of their lives, often cases. Okay? Um, in this case, it's showing you know, roughly a five-year difference in reading level um, by the age of 13. So what do we do about the achievement gap? Well, that happens to be where I come in, right? Um, so uh, <coughs> we came up with this, um, um, this entire system that we call a, bookmark, a smart bookmark system, right? I tend to build large systems composed of both hardware and software components. Um, and I said, you know, we could probably do something about that. Originally, we were talking about doing something with Alexa, where we create a skill where it can actually listen to um, uh, these book reading sessions and be able to give us some additional information, similar to what was done in Hart and Risley um, during the 90s. Um, but also be able to interject and, and enable a deeper conversation, a deeper understanding of the material reading, even if the adult, the teacher or parent, doesn't have that background knowledge. Let's put an adult in a room, a knowledgeable adult in the room, to be able to augment you know, either the parent or teacher that's uh, uh, reading along with this child. The system is um, large. Okay, this is a, a, I won't go through all of this, but there's basically a design this sort of cloud-based system to be able to um, uh, do a full voice interaction pipelines, interfaces to do analytics, to be able to um, get all the information out of simple reading sessions in a passive way without requiring a team of, of RAs or, G, or, or graduate assistants or teaching assistants to be able to uh, help us uh, uh, go into classrooms. Okay, a key component of this is actually what we call the smart bookmark, all right, down in orange. 
Um, we envision the smart bookmark uh, as, as an actual physical device. This is a device you would, you would actually um, have hopefully clipped onto the book you're reading, um, and it listens. It has a complete uh, uh, voice interactive uh, pipeline uh, built in, similar to what you have with Alexa or Google Home. But unlike Alexa or Google Home, which is completely cloud-based, right? In other words, all the, all the digital signal processing necessary to be able to recognize what you're saying and translate it into, into doing something is entirely in the cloud. Right? We need something cheap that we can take to a classroom, that we can give out to these economically disadvantaged families, and they can take home and potentially lose, right, or break. And so with the, with the sort of advent of really cheap computing, we can do this, right? So the smart bookmark, which is what we're, what we're actually developing as part of this award, um, is, is what we're focused on. The rest of it we're, we're going to have to build over time. It's a fairly, like I said, a fairly large project. But I kind of wanted to give, give you a little bit of context. What does a smart bookmark look like? Well, it's going to be an actual device. Um, this is what's inside, right? Just to give you some idea on, on what the size looks like. This is just a really simple Raspberry Pi with a, with a, with a built-in uh, uh, Wi-Fi, but it has the ability, we've been able to show over the last year, we're able to squeeze those, those large voice interactive pipelines you're using with, with, with your Echo or your Google Home device onto one of these, okay? If you're, if you're smart about it. Okay, so um, we're building a 3D printed um, a casing. We've got 3D printers down at the Institute, um, as well as the Fab Lab. We're designing them so we can clip onto books so they look like a bookmark. Um, single buttons, lights, you know, clearly has to be able to interact with you if you're going to talk to it. Um, and it's going to talk back. Most importantly, it has a voice driven interface in it. So we've got to incorporate that entire type of, uh, uh, that entire pipeline into these small devices. Um, commodity. These are commodity devices. You can buy this for about eight bucks, right? Um, and, and that's just for rapid prototyping, right? We could potentially even squeeze this down to be even cheaper. Um, it will require some voice interactivity acceleration that we're doing through um, uh, some other work, um, clearly network connectivity. Um, they were taking a couple different approaches to doing the voice interactive pipeline. We've had to modify it heavily. Right, so think of think of uh, of Alexa, right? Taking all the steps that, that are involved in in um, uh, talking to your Alexa device, chopping it up, changing some things, and then making it work on this small device. That's effectively what we're doing. Give you some idea of what that looks like. I won't go through all the details. We have to do some speech recognition. This is computationally intensive. This is the hard part. Once you do speech recognition, you have to do natural language understanding. You have to understand what the what the uh, um, text that was just said. Um, uh, means. All right, we got to do something with it, right? So this is where you you say, uh, Alexa, you know, um, uh, uh, order me, order me a teddy bear, right? Um, and then it, it has some sort of response that it has to deliver back to you. Okay, this is what your devices look like today. This is done entirely in the cloud, right? Um, our smart bookmark device follows the same basic approach, but now we're tuning it to be able to um, recognize not just a single wake word. You don't have to just say Alexa. You don't have to just say, hey, Google, right? We want that multiple keywords so that as we're reading through a book, we can identify the specific words that, were, um, uh, that are being said, right, as they're being said, and then prompt for additional information. This requires a quite, quite a radical change in the voice interactive pipeline. Um, additionally, we have to be able to understand context because, you know, words repeat, right? If I, if I say uh, uh, repeat, Right? I may say it in 50 different places in the book. I need to understand not just the words, but the context around it so I can identify what type of information I can use to augment that discussion. I've got to be able to do uh, book-specific keyword decoded and information augmentation. So in other words, I've got to do this for each different book. Right? So we're actually going through different children's books right now, limited set of books, different children's books and, and annotating different words that we want to be able to use to, for this system to be able to recognize um, and then provide deeper understanding for. There are so many challenges here. Just a computational one is incredible, okay? Um, squeezing this thing onto this, this thing that's smaller than a, than a card is, uh, is, is really difficult. Um, but we've already shown that it can be done through some other publications. Um, the usability is absolutely critical, right? You're going to give this to kids and, and, and people who may not know, you know how to use more technical devices, right? Um, we've got latency challenges, right? It, it's no good if you're reading through a book and 10 minutes later it goes, oh, you said the word repeat. Um, 
No, no, we need to do it as, in real time as we're reading through it. And it's got to be non-intrusive, right? We've got to make it look like something that should be there. But what this enables us to do is then later collect a lot of, a lot of information similar to what they did for Hart and Risley um, to better understand how children are learning and what that uh, background knowledge, how much that background knowledge can have an impact. I also run um, at the Institute I, for the, uh, the engineering program, I run the um, senior design sequence, which is a full year sequence. Um, I've had two students who have already been sort of looking at this for, for a quarter now. Um, Shauna and Gus will be uh, uh, actually executing it on this, uh, this project for the next six months. Um, and they're both part of the uh, computer engineering program. So if you see them, tell them good work. Um, we have some community collaborators as well. Um, uh, uh, Marcy is, has been working with the, the Bremerton School District and the Franklin Pierce District for, for quite a while. I'm the UW Tacoma representative to the STEAM network here as part of Graduate Tacoma. Um, so we've been meeting with, with um, not just local schools uh, on, on STEM related topics, but um, uh, last month I was at the Washington STEM Summit up at Microsoft, right, where we, where we talked about um, or went through all kinds of different proposals across the entire state. Um, and so we've been talking about not just taking these to schools, which we will do over the next six months after we have the system up and running, but um, to, for evaluation, but, but to then see if we can distribute it further, right, to, to collect additional information. So these things are being built now. Um, uh, I'm always on Lisa's bad list, I think, because um, I don't have my IRB thing done yet. But um, um, we're building now anyway, um, and, uh, um, and some updates. So you can track progress if you really want to and see how we're doing. Um, in March, there's a South Sound Technology Conference, which is always held in William Phillip Hall, um, where um, all of the senior design teams will actually be presenting, um, and including Gus and Shauna, um, and they will have they better have a first version of this uh, working. Actually, I saw a first version of, first version of or really a really a primitive version working last month. Um, after which, we'll then start engaging with the schools and start you know, getting some feedback on how this is working. Um, and by the end of May 18th, or by the end of the quarter, um, we host the institute hosts a an engineering uh, senior design demo day, right? And so. Um, probably right down here in Villain Film Hall, you can uh, actually see these things working. Okay, um, this is, like I said, this is a bigger project than, than um, um, you know, this little piece that I, I'm sort of focusing on. Um, I think I hinted that well enough. Um, this is also part of a, um, a four-year, you know, $3 million NSF grant we just submitted in um, November, I think. Okay, which, who knows what's gonna happen, but that's to build out the entire system. Questions?